I'm Howard Shalansky, professor of law at Georgetown University and a partner in the law firm of Davis Polk in Wardwell. I'm very pleased to be here today and I'm very grateful to the OECD for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about the relationship between competition and regulation. Um, I'd like to talk a bit from a US perspective where the debate has proceeded a little differently from the way it has in Europe, the United Kingdom and some other places around the world. And I'd like to talk in particular about some of the kinds of regulation that have been proposed for durable monopolies like, for example, digital platforms. Uh, before I get to that, just as a threshold matter, I'd like to note that I have represented as clients one large digital platform, but also a number of small uh, or competing digital companies um, whose interests are contrary to those of other large digital platforms. My remarks here today are purely my own. Uh, they have not been in any way sponsored or reviewed uh, by any party. A lot of what I'll be talking about today is based on a paper that I wrote with uh, Professor William Rogerson of the Department of Economics at North Northwestern University. That paper was published last year uh, in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review and is available online. When I talk about competition and regulation from a US perspective, I won't be talking about the doctrinal uh, development of how antitrust enforcement and regulation interact with each other. That has been set out in excellent fashion by the US country submission uh, for this particular workshop, and I would refer you uh, to that. What I'm going to talk about is why we should start to think about bringing certain regulatory tools that have typically been used in specific regula re regulated industry contexts to supplement or in some places an alternative to antitrust uh, enforcement in certain contexts. Um, to start, I'd like to note that the, the classical relationship between antitrust and regulation has been to see them as oppositional or as you know, complete alternatives uh, to each other. Um, Justice Breyer, writing uh, years ago before he uh, uh, joined the Supreme Court, wrote that antitrust is an alternative to regulation and where feasible, a better alternative. And what he meant by that was antitrust is designed to promote and increase competition, whereas regulation is more typically and traditionally designed to restrain and limit the excesses of monopoly. We'd prefer to be enforcing competition than to restraining monopoly because of the benefits the competition on the market brings uh, for social uh, and economic welfare. Uh, the late economist Fred Kahn had a very similar take on the relationship between antitrust and regulation. Inde indeed, he wrote, the antitrust laws are not just another form of regulation, but an alternative to it. Indeed, it's very opposite. And uh, Fred Kahn meant exactly the same thing. He was saying antitrust laws are what we use to promote and maintain competition. Regulation is what we use when we have monopoly and where we've effectively given up and just are gonna restrain the monopoly. But I think we've started to see that there are large firms, some of which may have a very durable presence in the marketplace that um, are very important to uh, the, uh, an ecosystem of complementary products, but also potential competitors. And when we're looking at those kinds of firms, a very important question arises. When might regulatory tools and oversight improve competition enforcement and prove a better alternative, not uh, a worse one as uh, uh, the classical view would hold it? And where might it be not the opposite? Where, where, where might regulation be not the opposite of antitrust, but a complement and in some cases, even uh, a, a substitute? Let me start with why we might even turn to regulation in the first place. And that arises from some concerns that we might have about the adjudicatory approach to antitrust enforcement, uh, particularly as it proceeds in the United States. U.S. antitrust enforcement and legal development proceeds mostly through a common law process of adjudication of specific claims by generalist federal courts. There's, of course, state antitrust law that may appear in state courts, but it's primarily evolved through the federal courts. And a judge will decide whether a given activity violates Section 2 of the Sherman Act 
by monopolizing or attempting to monopolize in illegal fashion. When we contrast that kind of difficult uh, decision with that of an expert agency or, or other contexts, we see, for example, uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, deciding if a facility, quote, emits air pollution, which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger the public health. Is reasonably anticipated to danger the public, endanger the public health a notably more complicated inquiry than monopolize or attempt to monopolize a line of commerce? Unclear. But in one case, we have a generalist court making the decision, in another case, an expert uh, agency. And the reason we enforce antitrust by adjudication, but enforce other broad statutes by regulation, might do, be due as much uh, to history uh, in the US as to substantive policy goals. The antitrust statutes came decades before the major safety, health, and welfare statutes before we had the institutional structure for that kind of expert regulatory activity. And indeed, if starting from the ground up today, we might now design antitrust enforcement very differently. And that is part of the thinking that should go into uh, whether or not we bring more traditionally regulatory uh, processes and enforcement mechanisms into competition uh, enforcement. So even with the established adjudicatory process, we should ask the question, might increased use of regulatory tools and procedures improve US antitrust enforcement? So some of the criticisms of the adjudicative process that we have in the United States um, you know, are, are set out on this slide. Generalist courts often deal poorly with economic complexity. Doctrine can lag behind knowledge and experience regarding the effects of business conduct because the common law correction mechanism can be slow. Indeed, precedent over the years has come to incorporate some economic arguments and presumptions that arguably turned out to be wrong, yet that precedent remains strongly on the books. So it could drive systematic under enforcement against certain conduct that we actually know may be more harmful than the doctrine would suggest, predatory pricing, certain kinds of vertical conduct. And indeed, the worst precedent might be the slowest to evolve through the courts. If bad doctrine deters plaintiffs, whether private plaintiffs or the government agencies, from challenging widespread harmful conduct, then courts will have little opportunity to correct the doctrine and prevent the bad conduct going forward. So when might these under enforcement errors and these problems of the adjudicative process be particularly salient? In the case of durable monopolies, durable monopoly perpetuates and compounds under enforcement errors. By definition, durable monopolies are resistant to market correction that might ordinarily result from new entry and innovation. So enforcement errors have more lasting effect. If enforcement errors don't last long, we might be willing to say, okay, we can run under enforcement errors and be more concerned as US antitrust law has been with over enforcement. But if those errors perpetuate under enforcement can lead to grave welfare effects. Indeed, a durable monopoly um, and the under enforcement errors are more likely to persist, persist even if courts or agencies enjoin particular anti-competitive acts because those injunctions might not be sufficient to get at the core of the underlying uh, durable market power. Indeed, we've seen certain large companies, Microsoft and Google are examples that have faced antitrust enforcement, but they arguably, arguably at least retain areas of dominance. Digital platforms in particular might be good candidates for the kinds of enterprises that have durable market power. Why? Because they have large economies of scale, they benefit from demand side network effects, and closely connected to the network effect notion is consumers face switching costs of leaving them. Now, it's very important to notice that not all digital platforms have digital market, have durable market power. Economies of scale may be, uh, may be diminishing. Network effects may be shareable and switching costs may be minimal for consumers at multi-home or keep a menu of apps on a, on a screen. So we shouldn't presume that digital platforms are durable monopolies, but in some cases we should understand that they will be. <laughs> 
So adjudication is therefore seen as particularly likely to lead to under enforcement of antitrust against certain kinds of large digital platforms. Well, better antitrust enforcement could, be, could mean more than just better antitrust adjudication. Some would argue, let's just let the existing antitrust processes and tools work their way through these new, new industries. Indeed, maybe the agencies could push a bit harder and bring more risky cases that might force the courts to confront bad doctrine and lead to faster evolution of the law. That's one solution. Um, we might promote better outcomes from adjudication through legislation to correct bad precedents. But of course, that requires a legislative process to work well and in a timely fashion. Yet another opportunity, another uh, option though, is use of rulemaking authority by an expert agency to exercise control over big tech platforms beyond the control exerted through traditional antitrust enforcement in the courts. And it is this last part that I'm gonna to wanna to focus on uh, in just a minute. Well, what are some of the potential benefits before we get to specifics of increasing the role of rules and regulatory oversight? Well, regulation might more read, be more readily available than legislation, especially where agencies already have rulemaking authority. And agencies, because they are expert and focused on the agency, might make more rapid use of new ideas like various forms of what are called post-Chicago, you know, economic learning in enforcement decisions. Agencies have large teams of economists in the United States. They can bring them to bear to bring those new ideas in more rapidly. And an expert agency may be better suited where appropriate to implement and supervise conduct remedies that require detailed ongoing supervision and a sophisticated understanding of markets and competitive dynamics. So a sophisticated understanding of what the economics of a market are, what the technology is, how data drives certain markets. And in this way, the CMA's team of data scientists is you know, a very good example of where an agency can bring to bear certain kinds of new and important learning very quickly onto, uh, into the competition uh, enforcement uh, arena. Okay, but just because regulation can be beneficial does not mean that it always will be. And so there is, it, will, it will always be better than antitrust enforcement. When might regulation be more appropriate than adjudication for competition enforcement? Well, um, as a general matter, other than traditional kinds of monopolies, uh, government does not step in to control market power. We leave that to markets and to the competitive process. And moreover, regulation has some very well-known drawbacks, high cost and effectiveness and waste, procedural unfairness, and regulatory capture, entrenchment. There's a list here. So for regulation to be beneficial, it matters what is being regulated and how. Regulation has to be well-aimed and well-designed to avoid some of these conventional pitfalls. Well, where could regulation be effective? Regulation may be more effective and appropriate than adjudicatory enforcement of competition policy or competition law when inducing the desired outcomes requires detailed and ongoing supervision and control over firms' behavior based on a sophisticated understanding of economic and technical issues within an industry. Well, an adjudicatory system is ill-suited to exercise this type of control for the same reason that courts have difficulty crafting or enforcing behavioral remedies in antitrust. Better outcomes might result from a regulatory system where an expert agency has authority to promulgate a detailed, coherent set of rules, has the resources to devote to enforce those rules and monitor and understand how well they are working, and appropriately modifies rules over time based on findings and new learning and findings of the outside scholarly uh, and policy analysis community. So what are some examples of the kinds of measures that might be better suited to a regulatory setting than an adjudicatory setting? Limits on discrimination. The uh, limits on the ability of firms to decide uh, who they will deal with on what terms. Requirements of interconnection, interoperability, 
API access requirements, and data portability requirements. These are all things that are being uh, vigorously debated, of course, in, uh, in the UK, in Europe, and in some uh, emerging legislation modeled on um, uh, some of the European uh, statutes uh, in the United States. Examples of measures where adjudicatory enforcement might be more feasible than regulation, stricter limits on mergers, particularly those involving nascent competitors, might be more of a case-by-case -case analysis than a rule-based analysis. Limits on loyalty programs, discounts and most favored nation clauses, again, those might similarly be the kinds of things that better adjudicatory uh, review on a case-by-case -case matter could, could improve. Those would be borderline for bringing into the regulatory system. But certainly the first three at the top of this slide, limits on discrimination, interconnection, interoperability, and data portability would seem more squarely to fall within the kind of expert and ongoing oversight that regulation could bring to bear. So how can regulation be most effective? Even in circumstances where regulation has, a, has advantages over adjudication, again, it needs to be the right kind of regulation. And I think three criteria should be met when considering regulation to enforce and promote competition, as opposed to regulation to restrain and limit monopoly. First, whether the regulation fills a gap. Does the regulation do something that antitrust adjudication or antitrust doctrine just doesn't do? Is the regulation effective and administrable? If it's too complex, requires too much, if there's too much uh, information asymmetry, um, if, it's too, if it's too hard to observe outcomes, regulation might not work very well, even if, if in theory well designed. So eff efficacy and administrability are key. And finally, consistency of the regulation with the pro-competitive principles of antitrust policy. The regulation should add competition, not withdraw it from the marketplace. Well, several common kinds of monopoly regulation have drawbacks when judged according to these criteria. Rate regulation is hard to administer and may entrench rather than promote competition. Line of business restrictions prevent entry and reduce competition in the off-limits markets. And universal service, usually a very good thing or in many ways a very good thing, um, that is to say the mandated provision of service to all customers everywhere on relatively uh, uh, even terms, can raise costs, entrench monopoly, and harm the welfare of at least certain sets of consumers. So even where beneficial, one needs to have open eyes about what costs might, might be imposed by such, uh, by such policies. So in addition to finding problems for which regulation is well-suited, it is critical if we are going to bring regulation into competition enforcement to determine whether there exists a good regulatory solution that promotes competition. Regulation for digital platform competition provides a good case study. Regulation of retail terms analogous to traditional rate regulation would probably be inappropriate for digital industries because of the importance of technological innovation and the returns to such innovation. And because at least competition on the margins is far from absent, at least in most such industries, but also because often the, the services are from a monetary standpoint free. And while there can be other metrics of competitive performance, quality service, other things like that, they can be much harder to judge than price changes. We similarly th think line of business restrictions should be disfavored. For one, it is difficult to define the boundaries in evolving digital markets of one market versus another. What market should one not be able to enter and at what point have things evolved to the point that uh, those market boundaries have dissolved? But also, and more fundamentally, a line of business restrictions could keep critical competition and innovation from consumers in the market that is walled off from a certain uh, entrant. Um, and history has not been kind to line of business restrictions in many industries. If we look to the case study of US telecommunications, uh, there were line of business restrictions following the 1984 AT&T consent decree 
and at least a thousand um, waivers, waiver petitions to those line of business restrictions uh, were litigated or close to a thousand uh, before the US District Court in the decade after that consent decree. That said, um, there is a role for light-handed regulatory interventions that neither set terms of trade nor impose structural market restrictions, but they could have some very positive impact. They could limit or control the harmful effects of market power. They can enhance the competitive impact of existing competitors, and they can reduce barriers to entry for new competitors. The form of regulation that best fits the criteria and that could achieve those goals are rules that govern non-discriminatory access and that require interconnection or interoperability and data portability. This kind of regulation does require ongoing oversight and understanding of the relevant technology and markets, and therefore might not be very well suited to courts and adjudicatory enforcement. This kind of regulation also fills a gap, at least in US antitrust law, which struggles with essential facilities and refusals to deal or discriminatory dealing. Moreover, interconnection interoperability and non-discrimination rules have proven administrable and, and effective in other contexts and are consistent with the pro-competitive principles of antitrust. They are designed to promote entry and traction in the marketplace for complementors and to provide a, 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 an ecosystem in which those complementors may in fact become direct competitors to the underlying platform that is being interconnected with. Federal communications regulation uh, provides several examples of this kinds of regulatory control. Um, just for example, the Commission's program access and program carriage regulations in the United States were widely thought to have been instrumental in encouraging and allowing entry of satellite and telephone providers into the video distribution market. Think of wireless number portability. The uh, requirement of one carrier to allow you to bring your number to another carrier um, is widely thought to have increased competition between wireless providers by reducing the switching costs to consumers. No one wants to lose the number they've had for a long period of time. And never mind the most basic form of interconnection that was put in place by in the United States in the 1996 uh, Telecommunications Act, which uh, requires all uh, uh, telecommunications carriers or telephone carriers to interconnect with each other to exchange traffic. That was something that was not put in place in the early parts of the 20th century in the US and led to the rise of AT&T as a monopoly in the first place. We think that regulating discrimination, limiting discrimination and, and requiring uh, interoperability is a far uh, easier form of regulation and far more appropriate uh, than uh, regulating the level of prices and we can break some of the concern that came in the classical view from the information asymmetries of setting prices and say, look, we're not setting prices here. We need much less information and can do a much more light handed kind of touch, not by setting uh, the terms of trade, but by prohibiting unreasonable discrimination uh, or uh, uh, refusal to interconnect. Limiting discrimination and requiring interconnection can have two different desirable effects. It can prevent a dominant platform from leveraging its market power into industries that rely on the platform. This directly protects competition in what I call the dependent or complementary industry, uh, but it protects and fosters a potential source of new entrants into the core platform industry itself. And it of course prevents a dominant platform from extracting excessive rents from the dependent industry and reducing incentives for innovation by those complementary uh, service providers. Much more generally, what interconnection and interoperability do is allow the underlying base user base of the core platform to be accessed by complementary product providers, to allow those product providers to add services and use cases and to get more traction in the marketplace rather than being at the mercy of an underlying platform that might be able to block them uh, from its users through exclusion from 
uh, appearing on uh, an app directory or some other form uh, of, or, or, or limit of interoperability and interconnection. So where we have a durable monopoly, durable market power in place, one where the typical kinds of doctrinal attacks that would come through the adjudicative process are unlikely to create the kinds of entry and market disruption that we count on to bring benefits to consumers over time, these kinds of regulatory solutions are something that should be uh, embraced, investigated, uh, and, and not feared as they were in the older classical model uh, as we move forward uh, with developing competition policy and a more holistic adjudicative and regulatory approach. Again, many jurisdictions are far, are far down the road uh, in this regard. Hopefully some of the, my remarks and some of these slides can help to inform what kinds of regulation and what criteria should be, uh, should be put in place. But we're more at the beginning of this debate in the United States and hopefully these kinds of ideas, which a number of people have been uh, bringing into uh, the field. Uh, Bill Rogerson and I are hardly the only two. I would point to the work of Fiona Scott Morton and Michael Cadis. Uh, uh, Commissioner Rohit Chopra and Lena Khan uh, have brought in some very nice work and thinking in this area. But this is, this is uh, I think, a fruitful area for exploration going forward for competition policy, both in the United States and around the world um, in appropriate contexts. Thank you very much. I look forward to all of the discussion that will occur in the panels themselves. Thank you. Thank you.